That's a, 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 to me, a very personal question. I feel as if I have imposter syndrome today. I mean, like we all go through that. We all have that, that negative feeling about ourselves, our limiting beliefs. There's two ways to challenge that and, and to, really, uh, to really confront that. For me, I went to life coaching school. I became certified as a life coach about seven or eight years ago. And that just, for me, opened the floodgates. All of a sudden, I started asking myself these questions. What is my purpose? What is my why? Why am I doing this? And getting really clear about what my life looks like 30 years from now and really getting that locked in to understanding why am I doing all this work? So when you do have a rough day or a rough week or a rough month for that matter, you don't quit. I always said to myself, I don't want to go back to the restaurant. I don't want to go back to washing dishes. I will do whatever I need to do not to do that. This is the Real Estate Wife Show, and I'm your host, Pinky Lomba, a commercial real estate investor. And today I have a very, very special guest, I would say, a celebrity guest, <laughs> Chino Barber, with me. Welcome, Chino. I'm so excited to have you with me today. Vinky, I wish my wife was on the podcast because she could hear that I'm a celebrity now. I keep telling her that and she doesn't <laughs> believe me, but I'm like, yes, I've made it. People are calling me celebrities now. So thank you. I appreciate, appreciate the invite on the show. I'm looking forward to spending the next few minutes with you on the show. Of course. A little bit about Gino. Gino is an investor, business owner, author, and an entrepreneur. With a remarkable real estate portfolio of over 200 multifamily units and $250 million in asset under management, Gino has made a significant impact in the industry. Alongside his partner, Jake, and we need to get Jake on my show as well one of these yes. days. He co-founded Jake and Gino, a premier multifamily real estate education community that has seen their students close over 60,000 units and achieved $4 billion with B in mm -hmm. deal volume. Gino is also a best-selling author known for his books, Wheelbarrow Profits, The Honey Bee, and The Family Food and Friars. Now, today we're going to dwell in Gino's journey and hear about him. Our topic is how to scale your multifamily portfolio. So Gino, before we get started, if you can take a minute and briefly tell us who you are, how did you get here, and how did you get started with your real estate journey? That question could take up 30 minutes, Vinky. So I'm going to give the shortened version because I think it's important when people hear 1,500 units, when they hear that I have six children, when they hear that I have multiple businesses, it all really started the real estate journey back in 2002. Me and my brother bought a threeplex. It started with a triplex and I owned a restaurant with my brother and we were just looking for passive income, like what everyone else is looking for. And I didn't want to fix and flip. I already had the job and it started with a humble threeplex. So people are always saying, I need to go big. You need to think big and start small. That threeplex led me to another deal, which didn't work out, which led me to another deal that didn't work out. And then ultimately I said to myself, I've got to stop making these mistakes. I'm taking this massive action but I don't have education. I can buy a duplex or a triplex by myself, but if I want to buy something more commercial, larger, I'm going to need some type of mentorship. So I went out and I got into two different mentorship programs. I luckily, fortunately met Jake back in 2009. He was a pharmaceutical rep for a big company and he was doing catering orders out of my restaurant. And we just struck up a really good relationship. And in 2011, fortunately, once again, he decided to leave New York. He was an economic deserter, as he likes to say. And he left and he went to Knoxville, Tennessee. And like when you're in New York back in the early 2000s, you're like, where's Knoxville? I had no idea where Knoxville, Tennessee was. I'm fortunate that he left and then he went to that market mm -hmm. because we started investing in that market in 2011. It took us 18 months to find that first deal. And in 2013, Jake and I bought our first deal at a 25 unit apartment complex. And the significance of that back in 2011, 12, and 13, the market is shifting back to, to that time period that we bought our first deal. Because everyone's saying to me the last few years, oh, the market's at a high, the market's at a high. I'm going to wait till the market resets and slows down a little bit. Well, we're getting to that point now. And I see people are starting to exit and starting to get afraid now. So now I think to me is the opportunity these next couple of years where I think the real estate market's going to go back into a buyer cycle. So for anybody out there looking to get into real estate, now is the ideal time. The last couple of years was harder 
to actually go out and find deals. You could have found a ton of capital, but now once you've got the capital, I think the deals are going to be flowing back to us. The capital is like kind of a little bit dried up too, but let's touch on that a little bit later. Sure. But I'm going to ask you a question here. You mentioned a couple of good things. You said education and mentorship. You started on your own with Triplex and then you thought education is very, very important and following or following a good mentor is going to be even better for you. So what made you make that decision or what made you realize that, okay, I'm missing on these things and I really need to do much more than what I'm doing by myself? Because most of the time people do not realize that they just keep on doing like, okay, no, 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 I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. And there goes 10 years. I I had two really big developments that happened in my life. The first one is I lost $172,000 in 2005. I partnered with somebody. I didn't know what due diligence was. I didn't know how to underwrite a deal. I didn't know what a syndication was. I never flew out to the property. I just said, here's money. Let me invest with this person. I had no idea what I was doing. And that mistake really led to a lot of pain. And that's the second thing. I had a ton of pain and I wanted to learn. And what I've noticed over the last five or six years with the Jake and Gino community, there's two ways that we learn. You either learn on the street, like I did, or you learn in the classroom. And learning in the classroom with people who've done it already is going to significantly increase your chances of doing much better. And it's going to save you time and it's going to save you a ton of money. And when I joined those mentorships in 2008, it's not like I became an overnight success. But what I did do is I understood the business. All of a sudden, I knew how to underwrite deals. I knew what due diligence was. I knew what a syndication was. Mm -hmm. And when I met Jake, Jake didn't know any of that. So everyone says, oh, you were lucky to meet him. Yeah, I was lucky to meet him. But if I didn't have the skills and I learned the skills, it would have been for nothing. So that education part is really, really important. There's two types of people, the type of people that educate themselves to death and never take action. And then there's the types of people that take a ton of action and never get educated. You want to couple both of those together. I was doing massive action and not getting educated. Once I decided to say to myself, time out, let me learn the business because there's a lot more to it than just going out and buying a triplex here, different kinds of financing, different kinds of capital raising. There's different kinds of buying, creative creative buying, all those different strategies that I didn't know. And I think, unfortunately, when you're younger, I think there's a Mark Twain quote that says, it's not what you don't know that hurts you. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And we all have these limiting beliefs. I can't buy that 100 unit apartment complex. How am I going to get the money to do that? Well, if you have that premise and you have that limiting belief, you're never going to go out and underwrite 100 unit deals. But if you understand that, hey, that 100 unit apartment complex, I can get some investors and partner up with them and I can raise capital or creative financing. We just put an 80 unit deal on the contract that fell out of contract because of the due diligence. There was a ton of CapEx, but the seller basically gave us a million dollars down a seller finance note. So we need a million less dollars to get that deal. So there's so many ways to do it. So I'm challenging everyone out there that has limiting beliefs around getting into any anything they want to, whether it's losing weight, whether it's getting financially free, you need to start surrounding yourself with people who have had that success and stop listening to people who have never done a deal in real estate and telling you, yeah, that's risky. How would they know? They've never tried it. Go around and find yourself people who have actually succeeded in it and start learning from those people. I like that. And especially finding the right mentor who has done that, who has Mm -hmm. all those experiences, because there's no possible way for you to make all the mistakes yourself in a lifetime and learn. (laughs) It's better to learn from others' mistakes. I love that. So you have scaled to 1,500 units within, I think, less than five years, if I'm Mm -hmm. correct on that number. So what are the some key strategies or tactics that you used to scale your portfolio, I would say rapidly, quite rapidly, you know. Uh, I I think, Vinky, the the first really important question that everyone has to ask themselves is, do you want to scale quickly? Now, there's no right or wrong answer. For Jake and myself, I'm going to be completely honest with everybody. If we could have gotten to 100 units we would have been champions. We were like, we get 100 units. We're rock stars. 100 units times $100 a door. That's $10,000 a month in, in, in passive income. That's phenomenal in cash flow. So for us, I think the first question is, do you want to scale? And, and you know, that also begs the question for Jake and myself, we were vertically integrated. So we couldn't scale as quickly as the average person who has third-party property management. So we read the book, Small Giants. 
mm-hmm. by Bo Burlingham. We interviewed him on the Jake and Gino channel, and that really gave us a lot of clarity. I wish I'd read it years ago. So for you to start scaling, I think you have to start understanding the business and understanding what scaling allows you to do. Do you want to have a company where you're managing the properties yourselves and you're bringing all that, all that you know, payroll in-house? It's been very difficult the last couple of years to scale that kind of organization, but we've done it. We started out. Or do you want to be part of a group? Where you're raising capital and you're part of a general partnership where you're able to scale and you're able to scale a lot quicker from that. Then ultimately, what are your goals? Are you are you trying to do this business part-time where you're, you know, an attorney who's getting paid a ton of money and just, I want some passive income, put some money on the side, and I want I want people to invest my money. I want to become a limited partner. That's a way to scale a portfolio on the limited partner side as a silent as a silent investor or do you want to get down into the weeds do you want to grow a syndication business where you're raising capital and growing that aspect of it or hey do you want to just buy buildings by yourself and do you ultimately want to start partnering with others because what happens with the business when you start scaling i was fortunate on our third deal it was a four million dollar deal this is eight or nine years ago jake and i didn't have the balance sheet our balance sheet wasn't strong enough. I was fortunate that at the restaurant, I met the partner that I have now. His name is Mike. He came into the restaurant one day and we started talking geopolitical and he was a hedge fund trader. He didn't know that I you know, had the knowledge and the experience. Once again, lucky conversation. And I said, Mike, I'm investing in multifamily down in Tennessee. Would you like to take a look at the, the, the deal we're doing? He's saying, absolutely. I'm buying single family homes in Connecticut for $2 million and I'm getting $10,000 a month in rents. Those numbers that you're talking about are a lot better. So I was fortunate to be able to scale with Mike because all of a sudden he brought a very strong balance sheet to him, but it was value for value. Jake and I brought the deals and we brought the value on the real estate side and Mike, we were able to leverage Mike's balance sheet. So that's one way that we scaled Vinky. I think the other way was we were very diligent in saying to ourselves, every time we bought a property and we repositioned that property, we were able to refinance the proceeds out and put it into the next deal. I mean, we've been able to refinance over $25 million from our portfolio over the last eight or nine years. And that money just keeps going back into the deals, going back into the deals. And I think the third strategy is the creative financing. When we started out, seller financing was was really, really popular. We've probably done uh, $20, $25 million in seller finance deals. It stopped over the last few years because sellers didn't, didn't need that. There was no motivation. There was no stress in the market. Anybody go out and get a loan, that's slowly coming back. We just closed the deal back in January with seller financing. So that strategy is another way to start scaling. But I think ultimately, the way to answer the question is start doing the deals. You select the market. We selected Knoxville, Tennessee, and the MSA. You start looking for deals in that market. You start investing and putting in offers. You're doing property tours. You start taking down these assets and you do one asset at a time. You get to be an expert in that market. Once you understand that market, you learn all the brokers, you learn all of the all the players in that real estate space, focus on that and start growing and start putting more, what we would say, more deals in the contract. And as you want to scale, you're going to have to find partners in a multifamily, whether it's other partners to do deals, whether it's in investors. And you know, when we started scaling, there was a point in our journey when we said to ourselves, we're running out of capital. We need to do a couple of syndications. So we started syndicating deals and that was another way for us to continue to scale. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up questions. You mentioned three strategies. First question was, you wanted to ask yourself, do you want to scale, right? Yes. And, um, if you wanted to scale, what is needed for that? That's the first question. And a lot of times people get the Good question. syndrome. Yes. I ask you, did you get that? Or how did you deal with that? Because we all are human beings and we always get that. Oh, we are not mm-hmm. enough. Somebody's doing better than me because we're trying to compete or trying to compare ourselves. Mm-hmm. So how did you deal with that? You know, because scaling is like a giant in itself, that question, you know. It could <sighs> totally bring you down because you get scared. Oh my gosh, yes. can I scale? Yes. Can I get to that level? That's a that's a, a, a to me a very personal question. I feel as if I have imposter syndrome today. I mean, like we all go through that. We all have that that negative feeling about ourselves, our limiting beliefs. There's two ways to challenge that and and to really uh, to really confront that. 
for me, I went to life coaching school. I became certified as a life coach about seven or eight years ago. And that just for me opened the floodgates. All I started by starting asking myself these questions. What is my purpose? What is my why? Why am I doing this? And getting really clear about what my life looks like 30 years from now and really getting that locked in to understanding why am I doing all this work? So when you do have a rough day or a rough week or a rough month for that matter, you don't quit. I always said to myself, I don't want to go back to the restaurant. I don't want to go back to washing dishes. I will do whatever I need to do not to do that. And I think the second thing that most people just don't understand is the power of a partnership. I mean, Jake and I are we're attached at the hip. We do a lot of almost everything together. Um, our, you know, our, our children all of a sudden have become really good friends. He lives in Knoxville. I live in St. Augustine. We do things you know, together. And for me, when I'm having a rough day, I speak to him and for him, same thing. This past weekend, it was a Memorial Day weekend. We're talking to each other on Friday night at 5.30 p.m. going through a deal. And we actually got the deal on the contract today, believe it or not. And that's the power. If you're all by yourself on an island, you have nobody to talk to. When you're feeling down and you're feeling depressed and you need the motivation, there's no one there. But for me, I am not letting my partner down and he's not letting me down. So we're working for each of ourselves. We're working for our families. And I think that's something that I think People don't understand how important and how powerful it is to have an accountability partner or any kind of partner. And that's why, to me, the mentorship is so important and, and the Jake and Gino community is so important because I sort of use them as an accountability to becoming a better educator, to becoming a better investor, to getting all these students together that are like-minded and to be able to create accountability for them when we have our weekly lessons, when we have our internal boot camps and they show up. If you don't have that accountability in life, all of a sudden things get a little bit difficult. You're not going to be able to scale your company. And I think the second part to scaling that company, which I mean, I didn't even think about mentioning, but for us, it was all about mentorship again. We use the OS retraction. We use the company called Scaling Up. We paid for their services because I wasn't born scaling a company. I had one restaurant for 20 years. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to scale a business. I was the mom and pop. I didn't want to be the mom and pop in real estate. My father had conditioned me 30 years ago when, hey, it was great back in the 70s and 80s. You could have one business, one restaurant. You can make an amazing mm -hmm. lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That changed in 08. Everything went by the wayside once the internet came through. So I was stuck in that mindset. So when I came over to the real estate space, real estate and specifically multifamily allows you to scale up. You can become a multifamily entrepreneur. You just need to learn by these companies. I mean, Traction and EOS with Gino Wickman is where everybody should start. Quarterly priorities, level 10 meetings, cadence of accountability. That's where you really start building it up because all of a sudden you're hiring team members. You've got property managers, maintenance techs. You can't be that person, that bootstrapping person that you started out in the beginning. You need to grow out of that. And how do you grow out of that is by mentorship and by you know learning what other successful companies have done to scale. And then for us, ultimately creating core values and creating mission statements and creating culture within the organization allowed us to continue to scale our, our organization. Right. And you mentioned the partnerships. So we're going to dwell on that a little bit more. How do you find the right partners? You mentioned mentorship programs, because if you're not part of a mentorship program, how else you can network? Networking is really important, too. So if you can share some light on those. The only thing I can say about partnerships that I think would add tremendous value that I've learned, because some partnerships are like employees. Some work out and so, some don't. But to really raise the level of, of um, you know, success is what we call values-based decision-making. I think when you choose a partner, whether it's a business partner, whether it's friends, whether it's a vendor, whether it's an attorney, your values have to align with that partner. And if the values don't align, after a while, that partnership tends to break up. You know, if Jake said to me, hey, Gino, I'm going to start trading crypto. I don't want to do multifamily anymore. The partnership's not going to work. Or if Jake said, hey, Gino, I really want to go out and I want to syndicate and I want to take down 3,000 units next year. That doesn't really align with what I'm trying to do. We're really aligned in what we're trying to accomplish. Our goals are very similar. We want to become the Chick-fil-A of apartments. So what that means is we want to really deliver a superior customer service. We want to stay in the Knoxville market. We want to add between three and 500 units a year on average to our portfolio. All those things align. But then from a morals perspective, we are ethics, we align very well on that on that as well. And you know, when you start choosing partners, just because you're friends with somebody doesn't really mean they're going to make a good partner. And I think, Vinky, the other thing with partnerships that people really don't, don't explore as much, and I think they should, 
it's expectations. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't have to worry about Jake working today or he doesn't have to worry about me working today. We, we both have a really hard work ethic and we're both 100% responsible. We don't make excuses. If something goes wrong, we take ownership. We try to figure out the problem. We don't, as we say to our team members, we don't want problems. Let's offer each other solutions. And I think that's important. So having an understanding of the expectations of what partners are supposed to do, the understanding that it's going to be hard work and you're going to work really hard and not make excuses. That's what's allowed us to continue to grow in our partnership. And we're trying to convey all of those core values into the culture and into the, into the you know, businesses that we're growing. I hope that answered yeah. your question. Yeah, it did actually, but I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Like you said, value-based partnership or value-based, just even making two, a lot of people use that terminology. But the thing is, a lot of time people don't even know how to find the right partners. They will go to multiple networking runs. They'll join so many, I mean, more than one mentorship program or coaching programs. By the end of the day, still, they are just struggling to find the right partner. So what, what is missing in that scenario? Because they don't even know who they are. For that's a good question. I mean, that's a soul-searching question. The first thing is, I'm looking at you in the camera right now, whoever's listening to this. What value can you bring to the partnership? Mm-hmm. We always are looking at what the other person can bring. But what value can Gino bring to Jake? And for me, it was very clear early on. I had some money. I had some business experience. And I knew the real estate business. What value did Jake, Jake bring? Jake was boots on the ground and he was willing to work and he was coachable. And once we did that 25 unit deal, things started to work together. Three months after that first deal, it was a 36 unit deal. I never heard Jake say, oh, I'm working today. I can't go collect the rents. Never happened. And he never heard me say, oh, by the way, I sent up the docs. We got to do uh, all the QuickBooks. We got to do the accounting and you got to reach out to the brokers. I never said, oh, I'm too busy in the restaurant. I found the time. So what you need to do is to do some soul searching and say, where can I bring value? What do I want to do in this business? Do I want to be a capital raiser? Do I want to be boots on the ground? Do I want to be an asset manager? Once you understand where your value is, then you need to find people that can bring different kinds of value. It's like, like I said, Jake was property managing. I'm asset managing, and I'm also bringing balance sheet, and I'm also bringing business development. So there's so many different assets and so many different functions in multifamily that you need to find your value and then go out there and see how you can provide value to potential partners out there. And then from there, do your values align, that values-based decision-making. If they do align and you're able to provide value to each other, that's what makes a partnership work. Because the worst thing about, it, about being in a partnership with somebody who has no value is when you start making money, you're going to look around the table and go, well, John is there. Why is he getting paid? Mary did all the work and John didn't do all the work. That's the worst thing that can happen in a partnership. And those partnerships will go up in flames in a heartbeat if that happens. Mm-hmm. I agree that 100%. But I think for that, you need to know your own strengths too. Yes. Because a lot of time people are looking at others like, I'm talking to you, Gina, today. And I'll ask you, how can I add value? So basically, I'm telling you to tell me what my strengths are. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's the opposite way. You need to know your strengths, your own values. And then you uh, you know, propose, okay, hey, I can offer this. How can I fit into your puzzle? That's the best way to do it. I love that. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask you this question. Earlier, we we're talking about scaling your business. And you're talking about the vision. You need to have a vision for your business. So how important is it to have a clear vision and long-term goals when scaling your portfolio? I think the vision allows you as a leader to be able to convey to your team members, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. Because I think most people think that employees are looking for the highest dollar amount. They're all, if I get this amount of money, I'll stay. But I think a lot of people, especially millennials, they want to work for, for, for a reason. They want to work. They, they want to have some type of goal that they're doing. And, and for our company, if the you know, if our employees have been with us for two years, they can invest in our deals. I mean, that's how much we believe in multifamily. So a lot of the people in Jake and Gino team have invested in, in our properties, dollar for dollar, no fees. They're partners with us. So that's one way that we convey to them, hey, you, you want to be part of this organization. We want you to be there. And I think it's important that whole culture and that whole core, core value and the vision to be able to share. Now, when you're starting out and you're buying your first 10 or 20 or 30 units, that's really in the back of your mind. But when you've gotten to 100 units or 150 or 200, you want to start incentivizing people to work for you because you want them to be part of your organization. And that's how you're going to retain talent. And you can ask me, Gino, you're full of crap. 
I'm going to tell you I'm not because I know firsthand because I had one restaurant once again for 20 years. And every time I lost an employee, I always blame the employees. I blame the situation. I never looked upon myself to say, I'm not a good enough leader here. I'm running this business just for my own benefit. I'm not really sharing with the employees the impact that we're having in the community. And that was my mistake. All of these baptisms we're doing, these communions, these bar mitzvahs, these weddings, these bridal showers, we're bringing joy and happiness to the community. And if you say that to people who are waitresses or are busboys who are working in the front of the house or in the back of the house, and you're conveying to them, you're changing people's lives and giving people memory, don't you think they'd be more willing to make a much better product and actually serve at a much higher rate? than what they were doing when I was employing them, when it was just the bottom line, just the dollar amount. So for you, as you start scaling your company, understand why you're doing this. Understand what you want your vision of your company to, do, to be and always continue to convey that. So for the Jake and Gino you know, company, I created the company because I want to empower people. I want to have a thousand students leave the W-2 jobs by the year 2030. That's my big, hairy, audacious goal. The students have closed over 65,000 units. That's over $4 billion. It's always back to the students. It's always back to people first, people first, unwavering ethics. That's our vision of our company. And everything that we do drives towards that vision. And the, you know, the employees need to know that that's what it is. And for me, the other, the other goal that I wanted as, as a vision for the company is I wanted really a family feel company where you know employees come in here, we're all barefoot, we'll walk around the office. It feels like a home. It feels like a community within the community with the employees because I don't want to come to work angry. I don't want to come to work mad. I want to come to work inspired. I came to work angry for so many years. I don't want to do that anymore. So I said, if I'm going to start this education company, I want people to be inspired. I want people to come in here and work and help the students out, whether it's the coaches, whether it's the sales team, whether it's the director of operations, whether it's the customer service, student success. I want them to be all on the same page. When we're all rolling in the same direction, that really leaves a lot of guidance. And you know, we're going to succeed if we can actually withhold the vision that we're trying to, that actually I'm trying to portray for the company. Wow, I love the vision and the mission of your company. It's not just about yourself or your company. You're trying to involve the whole community, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like you're making a difference. So mm -hmm. that's what is your competitive edge right there. I really mm -hmm. uh, kudos for that. But uh, the question I wanted to ask you, in your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges you have seen that commonly experienced by the investors when they're trying to scale? <sighs> Whether they're scaling or they're getting into it, it's this right here. It's it's our limiting beliefs and it's our mindset, like it, and it really is because for me, I I did a couples coaching retreat a couple of weeks ago with my wife, and we were in Ireland with a with a gentleman named Phil McKern and, and eight other couples from Jake and Gino, and it was really for me a transformative week because really little. I'm looking at the phone right here. Very little, very little internet, and we're working on ourselves, and we went into our past. And all the things with, with relationships with my mother and my father and we're immigrants and all of the limiting beliefs that they put on me, Italian immigrants, we had to save. We couldn't waste money. We had to invest our money. I mean, it was just always scarcity, scarcity. And my mom would always tell me, hey, Gino, you need to stay small. You can't get big. And an OA came. Instead of spending money on marketing, she's pulling money back. And like, this is the time you need to grow. So for me, I didn't even tell my mom I was investing with Jake until we had 200 units. And I'm like, mom, I'm leaving. Because I know that limit, those limiting beliefs that I had about, like you said, imposter syndrome. Well, you know, how can I do it? I've, I've only, I'm only a pizza guy. I've only got one restaurant. We get in our way a lot. And I think the clarity also, we don't lack motivation. I think we lack clarity. And I think if we're not clear on why we want to scale, on how we want to scale, and we just need to look around and see how other people have done it. One of my coaches was, uh, we were on a bus tour about two years ago and we we're touring our properties. And I was sitting with one of my coaches and his name is Bill Ham. And he turns to me and I'm like, you know, we're just scaling this thing up and we're just, some things aren't working out. And he looks at me and says, Gino, you have to understand something. Everyone out there is winging it. We're just trying to figure it out. And it made me feel good because I thought as if I was the only one who was having these issues. And I'm like, oh, good. Everyone else is having these issues. And I think that's what holds people back from scaling is not <laughs> having not having that understanding that we're all trying to figure it out. And I think once again, going back to that mentorship and the education that we, we hired scaling up the company, Vern Harness's company, we were able to get our core values worked out. We were able to get our mission statement worked out. We were able to get our, our cadence of accountabilities worked out, all of our meetings, weekly meetings, and all the infrastructure. 
that we didn't have, if we didn't work on that for two years, we wouldn't have been able to scale up the portfolio. Or if we did scale the portfolio, there would have be gaping holes in that portfolio and we would be losing money on our assets instead of making money on the assets. That's true. One thing you said, bringing it, that was quite funny. But I just <laughs> wanted to say it over here. We, we're, not, we're not delivering that message, bringing it. You can only bring it if you understand the basics. So you yes. need to have the basics in place. You need to have the basic knowledge. And we cannot compare with Gino, obviously, because uh, he's rock star at it, you know, and he knows uh, his game. So if he tries to bring it, I'm pretty sure it's going to be pretty good. <laughs> No. <laughs> you talk about your uh, in your coaching program, I or I read somewhere you talk about three step framework. So, what exactly three step framework is? If you can share some light on that. Well, when Jake started and I started buying properties, it took us eighteen months to buy the first property, and and I didn't really have a framework or a frame of reference on how to look at deals. Mm -hmm. So, for us, when we bought the first property, we figured out there was three legs, and Jake is sitting out one day in the grass. He's, he's doing his landscaping and he looks at a wheelbarrow and he's like, wow, three legs. So the wheelbarrow has got three legs. It's got two legs and a wheel. So the, the three legs is buy right, finance right, and the wheel is managed right. So when you're buying an asset, you need to buy it properly. So once you buy it properly, that's the back leg. Once you finance the asset, whether it's from you know, agency, community, credit union, and the financing is done, boom, you have the finance. Those two are fixed. Mm -hmm. That manage right is in constant motion. It's third-party property management. That's where the systems comes in. That's where the scaling comes in. That's in constant motion. If those three are working in, co in congruity, wheelbarrow stays up. If one of them is weak, guess what? The wheelbarrow falls down. Mm -hmm. And for us, one thing that I realized over the last couple of years, everyone in real estate is always saying you make money on the buy. That may be true. You may make a little money in the buy, but what we've learned is you really make money on the exit of real estate, whether you're selling the asset or in our case, refinancing the asset. So that's why it's important to follow that three-step framework. You buy it properly, you finance it, and you learn how to manage it. And as you're doing all three of those, you're increasing the NOI, you're able to exit out of that equity and put the equity into the next deal. Oh, I love that. You know, that's what only a, a smart operator can do. You're not going to understand the basics first. If you got mm -hmm. the basics, then you kind of add up on that. But um, let me ask you this. What are you guys doing in today's market? There's so much chaos, so much uncertainty. Inflation is all-time high. Interest is again raised, you know, recently. So people are scared. They wanted to hang tight on their money. But on the other hand, the banks are failing too. So what they should do with their money, just hide it under the mattress, I guess because they are not ready to invest either. But earlier you said, this is the time to invest, you know, and I agree with you on that, but mm -hmm. wanting to hear your strategies, what you guys are doing. Well, it's funny because years ago, my parents would have money in the mattress. We're Italian. So I, money in the mattress loses money, right? So uh, when you said that, I had a picture of my dad saying, hey, you know, didn't trust the banks and whatever. So he'd hoard <laughs> the money. So for us, there's three asset classes that me and Jake focus on. We focus on, you know, real estate, we focus on businesses and I've, I have whole life insurance. So whole life, I'm using that as a vehicle for today for cash value. And when I pass away, there's a death benefit. So I have assets. My kids are going to take over the assets. The death benefit will pay for, for some of the estate taxes, putting money in that asset as well. But for us right now is the opportunity to get into real estate because guess what? The brokers are actually calling you back. Mm -hmm. Years ago, the brokers weren't calling you back because they had 20 calls to offer. So now all of a sudden, I'm getting brokers emailing me deals. There's mm -hmm. deals on LoopNet. So now's the opportunity to go out there and start making relationships with these brokers. Mm -hmm. And if you've been raising capital over the last couple of years, which you should have been, you've got a nice investor database. Now's the time to go out there and start looking at deals. We'll, we'll, I mean, we've like I said, we closed the deal in January, 120 units. We've got a 105 unit deal on the con on the contract right now. So, I mean, midway through the year, we'll have over 200 units, which for us is great. It's not syndicated. It's just our. It's just in house capital. I think right now is the opportunity to start looking at deals, and deals will come out. And will come out. You have mom and pops that need to sell. You've got a lot of bridge debt that right now is coming due. That operators actually under order three and four percent, and now rates are up higher. I think as the economy starts to slow down. And there is going to be a slowdown. There's going to be a recession. As jobs are lost, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, rents are going to stabilize. They're not going to increase exponentially like they have been. There's going to be opportunity there. And no, no one really talks about it. But what really slows the economy down is debt, 
is, is banks. What are banks going to do? Are they going to pull on the lever of debt, of lending, and slow that down? That's what happened in 2009, 2010. That's why creative financing has been great. The, the agencies, the government-sponsored entities, all of a sudden, what they've done, Fannie and Freddie's, they're down to 65% LTV, 60% LTV. So you need to come up with more capital. So you have to take a look what's going on with the debt markets. But I see debt pulling back. I see a lot of these community banks, they're struggling because a lot of the depositors have pulled money out. And all of a sudden, money's gone to these bigger regional banks. And guess what? Credit unions are there. Credit unions are a great place to start looking at, at uh, debt for multifamily. So for me, right now, don't be afraid. Learn the framework. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it yourself, find operators out there who are doing it and see if you can join their team and start raising capital for their deals. But don't make excuses about, oh, this is a bad time. Now is the time to start getting, to start getting into the investing. Because I think, like I said, asset prices are going to be resetting right now. And there are going to be opportunities. I like that. Plus, Warren Buffett says, you know, when people are fearful, get greedy. So this mm -hmm. is the time to get greedy mm -hmm. and uh, take action. So we are out of time, Gino. I could just, you know, talk to you for another hour. <laughs> yeah, I could but, too. <laughs> uh, we do have a time limitation. So I'm going to ask you one golden nugget for my audience. One golden nugget. Find your strength and work towards your strength. And for me, my strength is persistence. That's the only gift that I think I have. I'm persistent. I don't quit. And if I figure out that I need to do something, I'm just going to work as hard as I possibly can to that goal. It has nothing to do with talent or skill. You don't get paid by talent or skill. You get paid by persistence and continuing on the journey. I love that. That's the best thing to have. So let's uh, move on to our rapid fire round. I'm going to ask you five questions, spontaneous answers, one word or one sentence only. Are you sure? Are you ready? I don't know. I'm pretty hard with one sentence or one word, but we'll see. Let's take, let's give it a shot. All right. So the first one is, what is one of the most important things that you've learned in your life? And how did your life change after learning it? Money was not the most important thing in life. And I learned it through coaching. I learned through what my purpose in life was. That's true. Like I say all the time, money is the byproduct of your efforts. So focus mm -hmm. on what makes you happy first and the mm -hmm. money will follow. Mm -hmm. What is one best book that you have read and recommend to my audience? Well, now that on that topic of money, The Psychology of Money by Morgan House, a great book because all of a sudden I understood my relationship to money. Money is a result, like you said. And if you, if you can understand your relationship and you start investing, It'll help you become a better investor to help you understand your relationship towards money and what blocks you have. That's true. You have to release the money blocks because this is all the conditioning from the childhood. Like mm -hmm. you were stating earlier, your mom said, save money, don't do this, don't scale, or play small. So these kind of things, they stay with us all of our yes. life without mm -hmm. us being aware enough. We are just repeatedly doing the same actions over and over again. Mm -hmm. So just at some point, you need to have that awareness, what I'm doing. That will help you scale. Mm -hmm. So in one word, what does life mean to you? In one word, what does life mean to me? <laughs> I would say joy to me. I'll, I can leave it at that. That's it. That's, how, yeah. that's the reason you work for, right? Yes. Happiness, joy. There's only three things in life. Peace, mm -hmm. happiness, and uh, I forgot the third one. <laughs> 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 what is your biggest passion? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people say this, but it really is my family. I've got six kids and we homeschool the kids. So I'm always around them. I'm always with them. And I, I love, they're like, I don't want to say they're my friends, but I have such a good relationship with them. And, and they're really great. My wife's done an amazing job with them. So I would say, I would say it's my family. So that reminds me of the third one. So this is peace, happiness, and love. Love should be uh, number love. one, and I forgot. Mm -hmm. Oh, how mm -hmm. silly of me. <laughs> <laughs> if you could turn back in time and talk to your younger self, what would you tell yourself? You know, once again, on that topic of money, don't mm -hmm. follow the money. I mean, follow the opportunity, mm -hmm. and the opportunity will lead to money. Profit is the fuel. It's not the destination. And I wish I would learned that when I was younger at the restaurant because I would have scaled the restaurant and hired a chef and then done other things. I, maybe I'm not be, I might not be talking to you today. I might be talking to Mario Batali, who's a chef. I don't know. But that one thing where not always following the money, following the opportunities and the opportunities will show up and the money will show up once you have the opportunities. 
That's true too. But I'm going to say one thing over here. You're doing very well where, wherever you are today in your life because mm -hmm. in life, everything has its own time. And success only comes to you when you're ready for it. Mm -hmm. So 20 yes. years ago when you were a restaurant owner, maybe all this was not in your vision and you were not ready for all this. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason you need to game up, like educating yourself, having the right mentor. You need to set the ground. If the ground mm -hmm. is not set, you won't know what to do with success. So that's the reason. But this brings us to end of our conversation for today, at least. Maybe we'll have you back some other day to continue sure. this. But uh, tell me one thing. How can people reach out to you? Just go to jakeandgino.com. You'll go to the website. We have podcasts, books, webinars. And just go take a look at the website. We've got everything on there. Thank you so much, Gino. I really enjoyed our conversation. I wish we had more time today. Thank you, Vinky. I appreciate it. Thank you.